Okay, um, so our next speaker is David Schmidt, um, and he's going to tell us about classical explainability beyond prepare and measure scenarios. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I'm sad that I can't be there in person. Um, so uh, as was already mentioned, I'm going to be telling you about classical explainability beyond prepare measure scenarios. So for kind of arbitrary circuits and arbitrary theories. And this is recent work done with some of my colleagues here. So in this talk, I'm going to spend the first 15 minutes or so going over some material that might seem like it's just review material, but actually the precise way that we've done things is a little bit more um, conceptually uh, well-motivated and it's a little bit more mathematically formal than has been done in some of past work. So even if this material sounds like review, hopefully you'll uh, still see the merit in it. So in particular, I'm gonna talk about operational theories and quotiented operational theories, which are also called generalized probabilistic theories and the relationship between these two kinds of operational theories. I'm gonna talk about representations of these two kinds of operational theories and the relationships between the different kinds of representations for these operational theories. And then I'm gonna introduce a theorem that we've proven recently that all of the types of representations that I'll introduce in this talk have a very simple mathematical structure. And then using this result, we prove some further results. Uh, in, in particular, we prove that for any stabilizer subtheory in odd dimensions, there's a unique non-contextual model and it's given by Gross's discrete Wigner function, or equivalently, the Speckens toy model. And in even dimensions, uh, we show that using this um, mathematical structure, we show that every stabilizer subtheory is contextual. And this is something that I think everybody kind of expected to be true, but I think, and it's been proven for some special cases, like for qubits, but I think, strictly speaking, it wasn't um, established previously. And then also using this uh, result here, we show that generalized contextuality is a necessary resource for quantum computation in a particular model for quantum computation, which again, I think is kind of an expected result, but it wasn't um, actually established previously. Okay, so let me start with a little puzzle. So here's a fact that I think everyone in this room is well aware of. Um, Gross's discrete Wigner representation has been very useful in studying quantum computation. And from a foundational perspective, this is this leads to a natural question. So it's been argued in the past that negativity in one particular quasi-probability representation is not sufficient to establish non-classicality in general. Because if you go off and you happen to find some other quasi-probability representation, which does manage to represent everything positively, well, that would be a nice classical explanation of what's going on. So why is it that negativity in one particular representation, namely Gross's, is associated with such a strong form of non-classicality, universal quantum computation. And by the end of this talk, we're gonna see an answer to this question. And the answer is gonna be that Gross's representation is the unique classical representation of the stabilizer subtheory. And I'll kind of give some reasons later on why this answer is kind of better than, um, it, people have, pointed out other features of Gross's representation that make it special, but uh, I'll try to explain why this result is a little bit more foundationally significant than, than those prior results. Okay, so you might have noticed on the last slide, I kind of sneakily uh, associated two different terms. I associated the word classicality or classical explainability with the notion of non-contextuality. And in particular, I have in mind here the generalized notion that was introduced by Rob Speckens. So let me try to justify this claim, and I won't spend too long on this because if you've ever seen a talk by Rob or myself, we, we always go on about this, why we think this is uh, the, the best foundational notion of classicality or classical explainability that we have in foundations. So this notion of non-contextuality was introduced as a natural extension of the Koch and Specker notion of non-contextuality. And it's the extension that you're naturally led to when you start trying to give foundational motivations for why Koch and Specker non-contextuality is a good assumption, you realize that any motivations you can give for it are also motivations for the generalized notion. And furthermore, this generalized notion can apply to arbitrary scenarios and arbitrary um, types of processes, not just to sharp measurements like the Koch and Specker notion. 
And it also doesn't require you to make any assumptions um, of determinism. Furthermore, there's a kind of quantum optics notion of classicality, which in some sense can be shown to be equivalent to a generalized non-contextuality. And there's a notion of classicality in the framework of generalized probability theories, which again has a kind of independent motivation and can be shown to be equivalent to the existence of a generalized non-contextual model. Furthermore, you can motivate this notion from Leibniz's principle of identity of indiscernibles, which is a kind of um, methodological principle for building theories that was used successfully in past work, like by Einstein in constructing both of his theories of relativity. And when you see violations of other notions of non-classicality, sorry, uh, violations of other notions of classicality, like non-local correlations or anomalous weak values, these are provably instances of the failure of generalized non-contextuality as well. And contextuality is a resource for a variety of quantum information processing tasks. And it also has some natural features that you'd expect, like it emerges when you have a lot of noise or coarse graining or decoherence. So as you'd expect, classicality emerges under any of these. Okay, so let me start with some mathematical preliminaries. So we have the idea of a process theory, which is a collection of systems and a collection of processes on those systems, which is closed under composition. So here we see some process F with some input systems and some output systems, two other processes, H and G. If these three processes are in the process theory and you wire them together, then what's this resulting effective process from A to these two D systems must also be a process in the process theory. This is a very natural thing for anybody who's drawn circuits of any sort before. And then let's also consider maps from one process theory to another process theory. And in particular, we're gonna be interested in maps that have a special property called diagram preservation, which just means that the map commutes with co the composition operation. So this is a map that takes systems from one process theory to systems in the other. It takes processes in the first process theory to processes in the second process theory. And it does so in such a way that the map commutes with parallel and sequential composition. So we can write this like as follows. So if you have some uh, process here, F in the original process theory, and it's acting on, uh, it's a process from a system S to a system T. After you apply this map, now you're living in the new process theory. So the system types live in the new process theory and the processes themselves live in the new process theory. And we're gonna denote this uh, diagram preserving map in a convenient uh, diagrammatic representation. So here you see we have this original process F that's in the domain of the map. And then when to denote the application of the map, we just put the shaded box over top of it. So here we're applying the map eta to this process F. And you can see that what we're left with is a process on the system eta of S mapping it into eta of T. And the reason that we use this diagrammatic notation is that we can see that it's a manifestly diagram preserving um, representation. So in particular, if I take a composite process composed of H composed with F composed with G like this, and I apply this diagram preserving map, well, if it's diagram preserving, that means that we should be able to apply it to each of the indiv individual processes. So. And you can see that this equality uh, is sort of manifestly satisfied by the way that we've represented the map, because if I just stitch these edges of these green boxes together, you can see that these two diagrams look exactly the same without changing any real part of the diagram. And we'll talk more on Thursday about uh, what types of maps should satisfy this notion of diagram preservation and when you should assume it and why you should assume it, but I'll leave those um, conceptual matters for Thursday. Uh, so we, let's, uh, yes. Your question? So just kind of to fill this with an example. So, so all this box world lives on the side of theory. So, uh, so is an illustration of what you're saying that you could describe stabilizer quantum mechanics with the stabilizer formalism, or you could describe it in the Wigner function formalism, and then there would be a map eta uh, going from one to the other. Is this how I could illustrate it for myself? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, depending on exactly which Wigner function you have in mind. But so let's take Gross's uh, Wigner function uh, as an example. 
um, if, if you have a circuit in the stabilizer formalism and you want to represent it using Gross's discrete Wigner function, then it's true that uh, this property is satisfied. So you, you end up taking a quantum circuit into a circuit of stochastic processes um, and where the representation commutes with composition in this manner. So we'll we'll see a bit more of that in, as some examples in this talk. Right. Um, okay, so let's talk about a couple process theories that we're gonna use, and then we'll see how diagram preservation and uh, relates to those. So let's start with quantum theory as a process theory. Um, in this process theory, the systems are just vector spaces of Hermitian operators on Hilbert space, and processes are quantum channels. Now, of course, if these processes have no inputs, then they're density operators. And if they have no outputs, then they're POVM elements. So here's, uh, okay, can you see? It's being a bit glitchy on my end. So here's a, a simple example of a circuit within the um, this quantum process theory. So we have a, this is basically a prepared transform measure scenario. So we have a process with no input, followed by a process with an input and an output, followed by a process with no output. So this is just a quantum state, a quantum channel, and a, a, an effect. And the composition of these three um, CPTP maps, uh, where I'm, again, I'm just viewing these two as special cases of CPTP maps, is just given by the Born rule, as we're all familiar with. A second process theory that we're going to use extensively in this talk is that of substochastic matrices. So if you take substochastic matrices, you can you can compose these in the obvious way, and you'll always get another substochastic matrix out. So it's a valid process theory. In particular, it's the process theory when you take the systems to be sets, and processes are substochastic maps. So they're uh, stochastic maps which can be subnormalized. And if you have a process with no inputs, well, that's just a probability distribution or a subnormalized probability distribution. And a process with no output, we call a response function. It's something that takes a subnormalized probability distribution and maps it to a number between zero and one, so to a valid probability. So again, we can draw a kind of particular circuit like this. Um, of course, we can draw much more complicated circuits. That's the point of viewing all this as a process theory, is to have a naturally compositional approach to everything we want to say. But I'm just considering a simple example here of a simple circuit. Um, the process with no input would be a, a probability distribution, potentially subnormalized. And then we have a stochastic map, and then we have a response function. And the notion of composition is just matrix multiplication. So this is what the composition of these three processes looks like in this process theory. And so as you can imagine, this process theory is useful to represent classical probability theory or to represent the way that you have some state of knowledge and the way that state of knowledge updates under some dynamics. So for example, this would describe an ontological model, or it would describe Louisvillian mechanics, for example. And a second process theory that's very similar to the substochastic process theory is the quasi-substochastic process theory. So the only difference from the previous um, slide is that now these vectors or matrices of real numbers uh, can go negative. So on the previous slide, they were all um, valued between 0 and 1, but now they're arbitrary real numbers. So that's the only difference between the quasi-substochastic and the substochastic process theories. All right. Uh, yes, question? question? So, um, so because of the sub and substochastic, so it seems to me, does it accommodate, say, measurement of a bunch of commuting observables? Yeah? So when I measure the first observable, I have um, but I kind of get a random outcome with certain probability, I get this or that, but then I have my, the measurement of the next computing observable. Um, so that is my question. Can you can you represent by this uh, substochastic formalism uh, measurement of a bunch of computing observables in quantum mechanics? Um. Various outcomes noted somewhere in the theory. So I'm not uh, completely sure I've understood the question, but uh, I'll say uh, it, it sounds to me like you're asking about whether a particular quantum scenario can be mapped into this particular process theory of substochastic 
I think you were asking about the substochastic process theory. Um, so that's so that's a question about representations of quantum theory, and it's kind of going to come later in this talk. But at present, uh, like within this process theory natively, there's no um, quantum theory doesn't live in the process theory of substochastic matrices natively. You can ask about whether a given subset of quantum theory can be mapped into that in a particularly meaningful way. Um, but maybe I can hold off on answering that for, for a bit. OK. Um, OK, so before I can get to that sort of question of representation, I want to introduce two more kinds of process theories. So uh, we have the notion of an operational theory. And in particular, this when I'm being precise, I'll call it an unquotiented operational theory. And we'll see why in a second. So an operational theory is a process theory together with a probability rule. So the process theory involves some systems, which are should be thought of as just abstract physical degrees of freedom, things like electrons, photons, and so on. And these are systems that you might identify in a laboratory. And then the processes on these systems are they're, they're lists of laboratory instructions. So they're, they're things that you can do in the laboratory. Um, there's no particular mathematical structure at present assigned to these. It's just a, a description of what you can do. So think of the, the box in this process theory. The system here, maybe you've got an electron and a photon, and this, um, this T here is just a stand-in for a, a list of operations you can do on that electron and photon. Maybe you can make them interact some way by building some particular measurement apparatus. And so when we draw a circuit like this, it's really just a long list of instructions for what to do in the laboratory. There's not a lot of mathematical structure here, which is why uh, um, we need to introduce a probability rule, which says whenever you take some list of instructions like this, there's a rule for writing down the probability of this particular outcome. Here we have the outcome being called E1, given what came before. So it, the probability rule maps a closed diagram to a number between zero and one. And once you have this probability rule, you can start to pull out some mathematical structures. So the first thing that we can define is a notion of operational equivalence of two procedures. So if we have two arbitrary procedures um, here represented by T and T prime, we'll say that they're operationally equivalent, and we'll denote that by this little symbol here, if and only if they give rise to the exact same probabilities in every possible circuit that you can embed them in. So here we see this is the one way to represent the most general circuit that you can embed a transformation in. Crucially, you have to have this kind of side channel here. And we see T and T prime being embedded in that same circuit. So if these probabilities are the same for all possible bipartite states and effects here, where you have to range over all possible dimensions of these of the side channel as well, then we say that these two transformations in the operational theory, these two sets of procedures you can do in the laboratory, are operationally equivalent. And it might help to see an example of this. And I'll do an example where there's a trivial input. So this is the example where two states are operationally equivalent. So what that means is that for all possible effects, um, they give rise to the same probabilities. So in quantum theory, this just means that those two laboratory procedures should be represented by the same density operator. So for example, if we consider uh, these four pure states on the block sphere, well, we all know that the uniform mixture of the zero and one pure states is equal to the maximally mixed state, and so is the uniform mixture of the plus and minus states. So these are both, uh, th these. if you go in the laboratory and you prepare this uniform mixture of states, or you prepare this uniform mixture of states, they're completely different laboratory operations, right? You're, you're building macroscopically distinct devices to prepare these two states of affairs, but there's no measurement that you can do to tell these two apart. There's no measurement on the system that can tell these two apart because they're represented by the same density operator in quantum theory. So that's an example of two preparations uh, which are operationally equivalent. And you can um, consider transformations and measurements and arbitrary kinds of circuit fragments, and you can ask whether or not they're uh, operationally equivalent. And then you can go to your operational theory with all your sets of laboratory procedures, and you can group them together into equivalence classes. So here we have a group of three procedures, which all 
um, give rise to the exact same statistics for every possible circuit. And here we have a different equivalence class and another. And we group them all together. And then we can introduce a useful labeling of these procedures where we have two pieces of information that pick out that procedure in the theory. The first piece just tells you which equivalence class you're in. So it tells you which of these four in this example um, sets you're in. And then the second piece of information just tells you which element within the set you are. And this we call the context information because it's not relevant to the statistics that you can generate when you use this procedure. It's only relevant for specifying some extra details about the procedure. We call it the context of the procedure. So this uh, notion of operational equivalence um, turns out to be a, an, a proper mathematical equivalence relation or congruence relation. And so you can define a quotiented theory. So these are called quotiented operational theories now. And these are also process theories. And this kind of concept was first introduced by the, well, in the modern sense, at least, by the Pavia group um, when studying what they called operational probabilistic theories. Um, we're going to call them quotiented operational theories, or people also call them generalized probabilistic theories. They're all more or less the same concept. The key here is that they're distinct concept from the notion of operational theory that I've been talking about so far, the unquotiented operational theory. So there's this key distinction now. So how are these quotiented theories defined? Well, we quotient with respect to this notion of operational equivalence. So we can define a quotienting map, which I'll denote by this little tilde symbol, which takes a process in the operational theory, which remember we labeled with these two pieces of information, and it just throws away the context information. So you just keep around the equivalence class of each process. So represented as a diagram preserving map, you have to show that you have to prove that this is a diagram preserving map, but that can be done. And then we can represent it in the graphical notation I mentioned earlier. So here we see a process in the operational theory, the unquotiented operational theory. We apply the quotienting map to it, and we're just left with this equivalence class representation of it. So this is a process within a quotiented operational theory, which I'll um, often refer to as a process within a GPT. because Those are essentially synonymous. So that is the quotiented theory is the generalized probabilistic theory associated with the operational theory. And what's nice is even though these unquotiented operational theories don't have much mathematical structure, uh, the GPT itself can be shown to have a lot of nice mathematical structure. So the states can be viewed as living in a vector space and the effects similarly, and the, you don't need a probability rule anymore. It's just given by the natural notion of composition within the GPT. So all this mathematical structure just follows from this quotienting operation. Okay, so finally, now we can talk about representations of these different kinds of operational theories. Um, and maybe I should have mentioned you can view quantum theory as either an unquotiented theory or a quotiented theory. They're just two different views, depending on how much kind of information you want to specify. Do you want to specify all the information about what you're doing in the laboratory, like which particular set of mixed states you're using to generate the given density operator? If you do, then you work with the unquotiented version of quantum theory. But if you want to instead just specify the quantum state, the quantum channel, and the POVM that are representing your um, particular uh, procedures in the laboratory, well, then you can just work with the quotient to the GPT version of quantum theory. But there are two different ways of talking about quantum theory, and the way that you study these two are distinct, as we'll see now when we start considering representations of uh, quantum theory or of more general operational theories. So let's start with the notion of an ontological model of an operational theory. So this mathematically is a map from the operational theory into the substochastic process theory that I introduced earlier. So diagrammatically, we have some process here in the unquotiented theory. You can see we still have the context information around. And we apply this diagram preserving map, which takes it to now this, this process here is a process from a set lambda A to a set lambda B. And this process should be substochastic because it has to live in this process theory. And this map, this map, for this map to be an ontological model, it has to satisfy a number of properties, which I won't define mathematically, but they should be pretty intuitive. Um, so it has to reproduce the predictions. So when you wire together some processes in the operational theory, the predictions have to be reproduced by the analogous wiring together of the substochastic representations of those processes. 
Furthermore, it has to represent ignoring appropriately. So for example, if you have like the trace operation and the operational theory, that will be represented as marginalization over these uh, stochastic processes. Um, I'll assume diagram preservation, which again is something we can discuss at the end or um, on Thursday. And we assume that this mapping respects classical uncertainty. So loosely speaking, it's convex linear. To actually formalize what I mean by convex linear here is a bit difficult. We've only done it in a recent paper, um, but uh, for our purposes, it, it won't be too important here. And I'll show you why in a slide, why this isn't too important. And I'll just note again that states, measurements, effects, multipartite channels, all of these kinds of processes are just special cases of transformations. So, um, uh, so they're handled without any new definitions. The single definition allows you to talk about arbitrary circuits and arbitrary um, uh, representations of those circuits. So as an example, a simple circuit, which just back to that quantum prepared transform measure scenario, if we want to have an ontological model of this scenario, we apply this diagram preserving map to the whole scenario. By the fact that it's diagram preserving, that means that we can represent this state in quantum theory independently. So this will be represented as a probability distribution. And the channel in quantum theory will be represented as a stochastic map. And the effect in quantum theory will be represented as a, uh, as a response function. So these are just the three special cases of stochastic processes, um, which are in the co-domain of this ontological model. So writing that then explicitly, as I just said, this process here is just a probability distribution followed by a stochastic map and a response function where this system type now is just a set. So over here, it was a quantum system. And now we've mapped it through this uh, representation map to a set. And as I mentioned earlier, the notion, if you, the composition rule for quantum theory is given by this. So this diagram is equal to this quantity here. And this diagram, well, it has a different composition rule because this diagram is living in the domain of the map, namely the process theory of substochastic maps. So the composition rule is, matrix multiplication. So it's just given by this. And by this equality here, then we have this equality. And so this should look familiar as sort of the usual ontological models representation of a simple prepared transform measure quantum scenario. But this all generalizes to arbitrary quantum circuits now, not just to this simple prepared transform measure case. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question here. Can I ask a question? Yes, so, please. Uh, all right, so you have mapped general quantum states um, to probability distributions, you said. Um, you know, um, that sounds a little bit unfamiliar to me. Well, I mean, previously you talked about quantum states represented by density matrices. And yes, the density matrix would have probabilistic information, but would also have the eigenstates. If I wouldn't want to think about density matrices, I could think of bigger functions, um, but they might be negative. So can you please tell me when you're mapping uh, quantum systems or states uh, to probability distributions, what do you have in mind completely? Um, so once again, I'm not fully sure I understood the question, but uh, the Wigner representation, as we'll sort of discuss, soon is an example of a map C here. So if you start with a quantum circuit, the Wigner representation can be viewed in exactly this way that you, it's a representation of the full circuit, where furthermore, that representation can just factor in this diagram preserving manner. So the Wigner, the Wigner representation of this circuit would be equal to the Wigner representation of the state, which is a probability distribution, as you say, uh, or in general, it's a quasi um, yeah, substochastic that, that, process. Yeah, you know, it, it needn't. My, right. Okay. So may, maybe your problem is that I misspoke well, earlier. I I didn't mean to imply that these are um, actually all positive, but I, I said that, and that was just a mistake. So as I think maybe you were just pointing out well, that yes, this these three processes here in general, if this C is the Wigner function, then they need not all be positive. So thanks for catching that. You are in this quasi substochastic framework now. Yes. Oh, and did I? Ah, okay. <laughs> right. So here I was referring to 
um, ontological models where we do demand positivity, so substochastic. But I guess you're you're kind of anticipating the next step where I'm about to go, which is that these sorts of representations where everything is positive won't always exist. So sometimes you can find such a map where these are all positive. Um, yeah. But but uh, I think yeah. In a slide or two, I'll talk about the case where the more general case where those numbers are allowed to go negative. Um, so hopefully that will help as well. Oh, wait, wait. Right. So here you're saying you're not talking about that case yet. Yeah, That's you're, right. you're talking about where everything is positive. And then what yes. representation do you have in mind for quantum states? You know, if the thing that what you have in mind can go negative. Here, everything is sure. positive. So what do you have in mind? Right. So if if you're looking for a representation of all quantum states and all quantum effects and all quantum transformations, then it's well known that no such representation will exist. But you can look for fragments of quantum theory, maybe for some particular states and effects. You can find many such representations um, sometimes. Other times, you can prove there's no such representations. And these are exactly the sorts of questions that we're going to be asking later on in this talk. OK, um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Right, so what I was talking about a second ago is ontological models of operational theories. Now here's a separate concept, which is very closely related. The only difference is now the domain of the representation is different. So ontological models, not of unquotiented operational theories, but of the quotiented operational theories that I introduced earlier, so GPTs. So as before, we have a, a diagram preserving map from the GPT into the substochastic process theory. I can represent it exactly the same way diagrammatically, but now notice that there's no context information here because this process is a GPT process, not a, not a process in an operational theory. And as before, we have these four constraints. And the nice thing is that now this force constraint really is just strict mathematical linearity because GPTs have a convex structure, a, a vector space structure on which you can actually define linearity. Um, but other than that, this, this kind of representation is exactly the same as ontological models for operational theories, um, with kind of the key exception that, uh, from the foundational perspective, the key difference here is that because the domain of the map is now a process theory which has no context information, there's no possibility of these representations to depend on that context information. So uh, if you're talking about representations of operational theories, you can ask, is the model non-contextual or is it contextual? Does this stochastic process over here depend on the context information? But here, there's just no such question that can even be asked because there's no context information in this, in the domain of the map. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Um, but before going there, I want to introduce a, yet a third kind of representation. And this is what was alluded to in the question earlier. And these are quasi-probability representations of GPTs. So now the difference is we change the uh, codomain of the map. So instead of mapping into the substochastic process theory, we map into the quasi-substochastic process theory. So we allow these real uh, matrix elements to be negative in the representation. Um, and uh, I'll just note that quasi-probability representations as defined in virtually every paper prior to ours, um, and also as defined in ours, are representations of quotiented theories, so of GPTs. They aren't representations of operational theories. In other words, there's, a, there's no possibility of these representations depending on the context information. So that's just a, kind of historically how this term has been used. And so we're sticking with that convention. We're not defining, you might try to define quasi-probability representations for operational theories, um, but uh, it's, it's kind of an ugly concept and it, that's why it hasn't been studied before. And so I'm just not going to get into that here. Um, so we have these three kinds of representations depending on the precise domain and codomain of the map. And clearly, if you have for some particular scenario, uh, if you find a quasi-probability representation of your GPT scenario, and it happens that all the elements in the representation in the codomain are positive, well then clearly that's an instance of a quasi-probability representation, which is also an ontological model for the GPT. Because that was the only difference between these two types of representations was whether or not the processes happen to be um, represented by positive 
real values or or negative. Okay, so uh, a quasi probability representation of a GPT. You can think of it as an ontological model whose probabilities can go negative. This is in keeping with sort of the usual terminology. As I mentioned, these or maybe I didn't mention this. Uh, traditionally, people have almost exclusively considered quasi probability representations for quantum theory specifically. But if you're interested in more general kind of beyond quantum theories, like in the GPT framework, you can use our definitions just as well. That's why I've defined them at that level of generality rather than specifically for quantum theory. Um, and I'll just note that the most common uh, um, quasi probability representations of quantum theory when it's viewed as a GPT are the Wigner representation and Gross's discrete Wigner representation. And both of these are diagram preserving. So they satisfy this fact that the representation commutes with composition. But there do exist uh, things, um, representations that have been studied, which are not diagram preserving. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of those on Thursday. OK, so now finally, we can talk about when these representations exist or not. So we can talk about when a given scenario has a classical explanation. So uh, I've, I tried to motivate at the start of this talk that when you're studying operational theories, unquotiented operational theories, the right notion of classicality, or one of the most useful foundational notions, is generalized non-contextuality. And I can finally define that for you mathematically. So an ontological model of an operational theory is non-contextual if and only if it satisfies this property. So whenever you have two different procedures in the operational theory, which are operationally equivalent, so remember that means they give rise to the same statistics in every possible circuit, then non-contextuality holds if they're represented in exactly the same way. So when you apply the representation map to these two different processes, you end up with the exact same stochastic map from some whatever ontic state space lambda A to lambda B. Um, whatever the case may be. So it, it's a non-contextuality is a property of a model of an operational theory. And maybe it helps to go back to this notation we introduced where we denote these procedures by their equivalence class and their context information. So if you have two different procedures which differ only by the context information, so they have the same equivalence class, then in a non-contextual model, they get mapped to the exact same stochastic representation. And so, so that was for, so notice that this notion of non-contextuality, it's about representations of operational theories. So you can also ask, what about representations of GPTs, that is of quotiented operational theories? Well, if you think about ontological models of GPTs, non-contextuality doesn't apply directly. And I mentioned this earlier, there's no context in a GPT on which the representation could possibly depend. So let's, again, look at an ontological model of an operational theory, we have, this is an, a process in an operational theory. So you have some stochastic uh, map, which is associated to it. And you can ask whether or not the representation depends on that context information. But if we consider ontological models of GPTs, the objects in the domain just don't have any context information. So their representation, it, you can't ask, does this stochastic map depend on the context of the transformation? Well, there is no context information that it could depend on. However, there is still a tight connection between non-contextuality um, and GPTs. So here's what that connection is. So if you consider uh, a, a given operational theory and the GPT defined by quotienting it, then you can prove that there exists a non-contextual ontological model for the operational theory, if and only if there exists any ontological model of the GPT. So once you've understood all the definitions, uh, this is really a quite simple theorem to understand. So to get from the operational theory, oops, sorry, to get from the operational theory to the GPT, you do that. You apply this quotienting map. So if you then find a uh, an ontological model of the GPT, well, that's a map here, and I probably should have written um, substock here instead of ontological model. That's uh, more mathematically. This this should say substock. So if you can find such a map into substock from the GPT, then you can define a non-contextual map for the operational theory, just as the composition of these two maps. And they're both diagram preserving maps and they both, you can just check that all the relevant properties are satisfied. And you can prove that the converse holds as well. 
So to prove this theorem, you're just showing that this diagram is commuting. To see it a little more graphically, if you prefer things that way, um, here we have our operational theory. So we have a lot of context information and we have the different equivalence classes. Here I'm just depicting the states. So we see four different equivalence classes of states. When you quotient, you throw out all the details of which, which of these is which, and you, you just represent these states as uh, their, the GPT representation thereof. So we have kind of four GPT states in the quotiented theory. If you can find an ontological model, which associates to each of these uh, GPT states a probability distribution such that the probabilities are, uh, the observable probabilities are correctly reproduced when you consider the representation of measurements as well. Um, if you can find such a model, well, that's this ontological model mapping upwards. And then you just compose the quotienting map with that ontological modeling map to get this non contextual ontological model of the operational theory. And crucially, you can see that because that map factors through this quotienting operation, there's no way that that map can depend on the context for these procedures. So it, these two processes in particular, because they're in the same equivalence class, they get mapped to the same probability distribution. That's what we mean by non-contextual. OK, so conceptually then, the upshot of this is that if you agree with me that non-contextuality is a meaningful notion of classicality for operational theories, then you should agree with me that the right or the associated notion of classicality for GPTs is not non-contextuality, it's just the existence of any ontological model of one's GPT. So these are two different but equivalent perspectives on when a given scenario or fragment of a theory, or maybe the whole theory, admits of a classical explanation or not. And this is a useful, so, so that's kind of the conceptual upshot. The practical upshot is that GPTs are often more easy to study than operational theories, precisely because they have a lot more mathematical structure. So this can be used then uh, to prove new, um, new results regarding classical explainability. And furthermore, this kind of equivalence of two different notions of classicality can be seen as a way of providing new motivations for why non-contextuality is a good notion of classicality. So I could give a whole talk on that, but I don't really have time. I'll just say one particular thing that I think is kind of cute. Um, so if you have a, a given circuit, maybe this is a quantum circuit or maybe it's a GPT circuit. So you've got a whole bunch of generalized processes on some generalized systems. If, if you just think about the most naive notion of classical explainability, you would say, well, can I draw the same circuit, but where all the systems are classical, so they're just classical random variables. And I furthermore consider that the the representation of dynamics on those systems is just given by some stochastic processes or maybe some subnormalized stochastic processes. So this is a, a completely classical circuit in the usual sense. And you can ask, like, is there such a representation that can reproduce all the observable predictions of this generalized circuit? And this incredibly naive notion of classical explanation is exactly the right one in the sense that it's equivalent to this foundationally motivated notion of generalized non-contextuality. So they're kind of mutually self-supporting, like it's a, it's, a, it's a very intuitive notion of classical explainability. It's exactly the one that you know, people like uh, Wigner were interested in. Can you find stochastic representations uh, with the same form as the quantum circuit? Um, and as we know, you can't for all of quantum theory, but you can ask sort of when does a given scenario admit of such explanations and when doesn't it? And that's exactly the right question. Um, okay, so all of this that I've just said is essentially just a more precise proof of the equivalence between existence of a non-contextual ontological model and existence of a positive quasi-probability representation. So this kind of equivalence has been known uh, for some time, but uh, I think it, and it was first proved by Speckens maybe 15 years ago or so. Um, but there's a, a couple of minor issues with that, uh, the definitions used in that work, which we've clarified in this more recent work, and hopefully which I've managed to convey in this talk. So the main difference by far, the critical thing is that the domains of these two kinds of representations are different. So we have non-contextual ontological models are representations of unquotiented operational theories, whereas positive or, or for that matter, negative quasi-probability representations are representations of quotiented operational theories. 
So it's not that these two kinds of representations are uh, exactly the same as was sort of implied by previous work by Rob and others, but rather there's just a, a kind of one-to-one um, -one relationship between these kinds of representations. There's an equivalence. And there's some other minor work, minor uh, improvements of this work relative to Rob's earlier paper and, and similar papers. Um, so we've defined things process theoretically so that you can apply them directly to arbitrary circuits. And we're more explicit about the mathematical assumptions that go into all this, like linearity and diagram preservation. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, finally, I can tell you some theorems that use these definitions. So the first one will be a structure theorem. So we prove that all diagram preserving quasi probability representations, and I'm going to focus on the quantum example, but what I say holds for all. GPTs that have a property called local tomography, which is kind of the, the usual class of GPTs people study. Um, so again, I'll just focus on the quantum case for the sake of time. Um, so all diagram preserving quasi probability representations have the following form. First, you pick a basis of trace one Hermitian operators. And then you, from that, you compute the unique dual basis, which satisfies this property here. So you have some dual basis, a set of these D, um, Hermitian operators, D sub lambda. And then you compute from this frame and the dual, you compute the vector of real values representing a given quantum state row by this trace inner product here with the dual frame. You represent the effects by the trace inner product with the frame elements, and you represent transformations, so some quantum channel, by this uh, particular trace shown here. And these have been called complete frame representations in, uh, in the literature. So there's some assumptions that go into proving this um, structure theorem. First of all, it only applies to theories with transformations. What I mean by that is uh, you have to look at the structure of transformations. If you're, if you're only interested in prepare measure scenarios, then it's possible to find quasi-probability representations that are more general than this. But when you, when you have a non-trivial spanning set of transformations, then you can prove this extra structure. And furthermore, it only applies to theories satisfying local tomography. So quantum theory, classical theory are both examples. And most GPTs are of this sort, but you certainly can find um, theories where it fails. Um, OK, so the structure theorem was about quasi-probability representations of uh, GPTs. And I showed it just for quantum theory, but as I said, it's kind of analogous. But we know that an ontological model of a GPT is just a quasi-probability representation with a further constraint, namely that the things in the image of the map are positive. So it follows then that ontological models of GPTs have the same mathematical structure. And similarly, non-contextual ontological models of operational theories also have to have this form because they're uh, just related by a quotienting map. So this kind of structure holds for all three of the kinds of representations that we've talked about so far. And this is a useful structure to have around because anytime you have some new constraints on the structure of classical explanations, they give you new tools for studying when non-classicality occurs. So this brings me to the final topic, which don't worry, I don't have many more slides. Um, I'm just going to basically list some theorems here. Uh, so where we apply the structure theorem to the stabilizer subtheories. So the first thing that we prove is that in even dimensions, there's no positive quasi-probability representation for any stabilizer subtheory. This is well known for qubits and maybe for some other specific cases, um, but we show that it's generally true. And in odd dimensions, we show that every stabilizer subtheory has a unique positive quasi-probability representation, namely the one given by Gross. And equivalently, there's a unique non-contextual model for this, these stabilizer subtheories. And as I mentioned earlier, this is this representation is equivalent to the Speckens toy theory. So either of these can be taken as the unique non contextual model for these sub theories. So this is a, a nice result. It shows that there's only one possible classical explanation, according to the notion of classicality that I've tried to motivate in this talk. There's only one possible way of understanding the stabilizer sub theory classically. And I'll just point out that Gross had a uniqueness result, which uh, showed that his representation was special. So in particular, he proved that his representation was the only one among this family of representations defined by Gibbons, Hoffman, and Wooters, which satisfied a, a property called Clifford covariance. So this was a, 
This is a particular, particularly elegant mathematical property, and his is the only of these representations that satisfies it. And I'll just point out that our result kind of from a foundational perspective is, is a lot stronger. In particular, this notion of Clifford covariance, it's certainly an interesting and important one from a technical perspective, but from a foundational perspective, it doesn't have any particularly privileged status. In per, to be specific, it's not a notion of classicality. So this doesn't sort of show that his is the unique classical representation. It's just the unique one with a nice mathematical property. And furthermore, Gross's result requires some particular ad hoc mathematical assumptions, which I won't get into here. In our approach, these assumptions can be derived. Uh, they're not assumed, they're derived from non-contextuality. And finally, Gross's uniqueness result only holds for odd prime dimensions, whereas ours holds for all odd dimensions. And Zhu more recently had a, a similar uniqueness result, but all three of these same comments apply to Zhu's uniqueness result, as well as Gross's. Okay, so this leads me to conjecture um, that when we go to the continuous variable case, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I, I would expect that the standard Wigner function is similarly the unique diagram preserving positive quasi probability representation, or equivalently the unique non contextual representation of Gaussian quantum theory. And if someone could prove this conjecture, it would be extremely satisfying because it would retroactively justify all of those papers which um, sort of claimed that once you see negativity in this one particular Wigner representation, that's evidence of non-classicality. So this would kind of put on solid foundational footing those intuitions that many, many people have had in the past. Okay, and finally, applying all this to quantum computation, um, this uniqueness result explains the demonstrated usefulness of Gross's representation in studying quantum computation. So in particular, Negativity in Gross's representation alone is sufficient to establish non-classicality in the setting of the odd dimensional stabilizer subtheory, precisely because uh, if you have a process which is negatively represented in Gross's representation, our result shows you won't find any other representation that can do better. But you need the uniqueness um, result to, to make that claim. And so then, I think this is my last slide, uh, what does this mean for quantum computation? Well, it's well known that any state which promotes the stabilizer subtheory to universal quantum computation must have negativity in its Gross's representation. And so what Howard et al. did in this well-known Nature paper was they proved that negativity in Gross's representation for a state implies that that state can be used to construct a proof of Cochin-Specker contextuality. Our result is exactly analogous to this, except that we've proved it for generalized contextuality rather than Cochin-Specker contextuality. And so Howard and et al they put their result together with this well-known fact to conclude that Cochin-Specker contextuality is a necessary resource for universal quantum computation in the state injection model. If you take our result and you put it together with this well-known fact, by exactly the same logic, it follows that generalized contextuality is also necessary for universal quantum computation in the state injection model. Um, and I think that's all I have time to say. So thanks for your attention. We'll open the floor for uh, questions. We have one from Paulina on Zoom. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for the very interesting and clear talk. I have, uh, first of all, a question about quantum optics, because I thought, I thought that people in quantum optics usually believe that um, the global Sudarshan quasi probability distributions, distribution is more fundamental for defining classicality or non classicality than the Vignette quasi-probability distribution. Could you comment on this? Um, interesting. Uh, no, maybe I would ask you to comment further. So, um, I mean, it's been a while since I worked in quantum optics. That was my undergraduate. But I, I had the impression that the Wigner function was sort of the, the more fundamental of the two. I mean, from a foundational perspective, neither is more fundamental. If, if you can find any positive representation of this sort. It's just as good as any other. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear more about the sort of PT so representation. The, the way I have, I have heard uh, people from the quantum optics community talking about it. They say the global Sudarshan representation is positive if and only if um, your state can be 
um, understood as a mixture of coherent states. Mm -hmm. And this they interpret or call classicality. Then since the Wigner function is the convolution of the Glauben Sutterschen distribution with the Gaussian function, of course, negativity in the Wigner function implies negativity in the Glauber Sutterschen distribution, but not the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I have, have seen papers that build on this idea that Glauber Sutterschen is more fundamental, but Wigner is more measurable, and then you find things in between and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. Yeah, tr truthfully, I don't have a good understanding of the glauber sudarshan um, representation. And I'd like to, because I think my, under my understanding is that it's a not a diagram preserving representation. Although I'm not entirely sure because usually people don't define it for arbitrary processes. The, the places I've always seen it discussed was usually just for states or maybe for effects as well. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to understand more about this. Maybe we can talk more. Yes, this would be interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Awesome. Another question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this question is kind of maybe more basic. Uh, but so you mentioned how these GPTs contain no information about the context. And you mm -hmm. gave a nice example of this uh, in terms of like how there's two different operational ways to prepare the um, maximally mixed state. Right in quantum theory, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not clear to me uh, how this sits uh, with um, measurements rather than with preparations, because uh, I would imagine that whenever I do measurements, the contextual information is contained in sort of which POVM uh, I choose to implement, right? Like which basis yeah. I choose to yeah. measure it. Uh, so how yeah, is this, this EPT? This is kind of uh, washed away. I'm not. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. So. The answer is a bit of a pedantic one. So what I would say is it's it's not hard to understand how you, you can put the structure you need into a GPT. So so natively speaking, the way at a, at a sort of strict mathematical level, the way that a GPT is defined, the state space is just a convex set and the effect space is just a convex set. And you don't actually talk about sort of sets of states and sets of measurements, uh, sorry, sets of effects. Um, and uh, so if you want to talk about sets of states, then you can you can kind of come up with some notion of an ensemble of GPT states, and you can use that to kind of put back in a notion of context for preparations. And similarly for measurements, you can um, talk about sets of effects, and then you can talk about a given effect appearing in two different sets of effects that sum to the identity effect. And so it's it's kind of clear how you would talk about measurement contexts as well as preparation contexts within a GPT. Um, but to do that, you're kind of, strictly speaking, no longer talking about representations just of uh, GPT processes as defined by quotiented operational theories. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that helps a bit. Uh, it is, it's clear that you can still study things like Koch-Specker contextuality, which is all about measurement contexts um, within a, a GPT. People have been doing this for some time, but at a sort of pedantic level, at a, at a strict mathematical level, the, the quotiented theory, I'm trying to see if I have a good slide for this. Maybe I don't so much. Um, yeah, uh, the, there, there's more I could say, but it's a bit hard to describe. So I'll maybe refer you to an appendix of, we, we kind of try to address this question in kind of explicit detail in a new a, appendix to our paper, which, do I have a citation somewhere? Um, yeah, I, I explain, we, we explain it better there than I could do in a minute or two here. So if you're still interested, I recommend you look at the, I think it's appendix A of this structure theorem paper. But it's okay. a great question. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I can ask a question. I hope it's not the same as Austin's question. Um, can you tease apart for us a little bit the similarities and the differences in the notions of quotient specker contextuality, generalized contextuality? In particular, the two cube, uh, the, the, the two dimensional case. So I figure 
uh, in the generalized notion of contextuality, the two level system is already contextual, but in uh, in Kosh's vector contextuality, you need Hilbert space dimension three. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so uh, maybe you can address in your answer, kind of there is a, David Merman in his uh, Reformed Phys uh, article has a, has a construction uh, for a hidden variable model that describes all measurement statistics uh, on the qubit. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in your notion of contextuality, that would be contextual. So can you illustrate the differences and the similarities of these two notions of contextuality a little bit? Yeah, uh, the essential difference, uh, I would say, is that the generalized notion applies to um, arbitrary processes, and in particular states and transformations. So if you look at, uh, I forget which model this is, I think this is called the Koch and Specker model, so maybe it's not the same one that Merman had in mind, but it's a, another well-known model for a qubit. Um, the set of ontic states in that model is given by the points on the surface of a sphere. And if you prepare, for example, the quantum state uh, like zero, so the top point in the block sphere, then the probability distribution over the ontic state space is this kind of egg shape object. Uh, this kind of egg-shaped object up here. Maybe I should have used a different color. And if you prepare the um, the one state, you get a kind of the bottom half of the egg. So it's a probability distribution over the ontic states. And so if you mix together the zero and the one state, you get this is uh, difficult on my with my mouse, but you get this kind of well, I, I don't know why I'm redrawing it because you get this. This distribution here, which has kind of a lobe on top and a lobe on bottom. But in contrast, if you prepare the plus and the minus states on the block sphere, then instead you get the kind of egg shape off in these two directions. And so the mixture of these two egg shapes and the mixture of these two half egg shapes are uh, distinct probability distributions over the ontic state space. So in other words, you can see uh, explicitly in this model the preparation contextuality. So in contrast, those, um, those constructions are measurement non-contextual. Um, so in some sense, the main difference then, the reason that you get contextuality for even dimension two um, is because you, you look at the way that the preparations are represented as well as the way that the measurements are represented. Um, so you have kind of more opportunities for proving uh, contextuality when you look at uh, not just sharp measurements, but also unsharp measurements and transformations and preparations. Um, does that kind of help? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thanks. Lena has another question. There's, there's, a, there's a lot more that can be said, of course. Uh, there's many nuanced and interesting relationships between the two notions, but that's kind of the, the most basic. Paulina, you want to ask your question? Yes, um, maybe a bit more of a comment. You have mentioned at some point that um, in quotienting, for example, if you look at quantum states or density matrices, uh, you can say that before uh, you quotient your operational theory, you know, might know uh, which states the density matrix is composed of experimentally. And afterwards, you do not know it anymore. You take only the density matrix as an object. Um, and that this is related to the fact that you cannot distinguish experimentally from which states the density matrix has is assembled. I think that this is not true. I believe that one can do experiments which will distinguish a different um, sets um, of states which uh, by classical stochastic um, preparation will give you the different density matrices. So, um, an example is, for example, if you have two apparatus which produce some density matrices by stochastically uh, choosing different, uh, preparing different pure states, and every time you get a pure state from apparatus A and a pure state from apparatus B, you measure the fidelity of these states. Maybe I'm making a mistake here somewhere, for example, because the fidelity cannot be obtained from one measurement. So if anyone knows um, that what I'm saying is wrong, would be interesting to 
to understand it better. But if one assumes that the fidelity would be a quantity one could obtain here, then um, and then definitely one could distinguish uh, whether the density matrices are somewhat from the same states or, or from different states. Um, this, this does not work with the particular case of the totally mixed state, though. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd have to understand better, I think, the specific construction you have in mind. But I guess um, if uh, if you consider just kind of a single shot preparation of a quantum system um, where you, uh, you have some uncertainty about which pure state was prepared, then uh, you, I think there's kind of a unique density operator representing that uh, situation. And the, because the Born rule is just a function of the density operator, um, there's kind of no, certainly no single shot way of discriminating different ensembles of pure states that lead to the same density operator. And I think even if you allow for um, uh, like a multiple runs of the same, um, multiple runs of the experiment, so different copies of your uncertain preparation, uh, you still can't discriminate um, which set of pure states. So I, I don't think that your example will come down to the, the kind of one versus many shot cases, but uh, I could I be may wrong. I to maybe I, to, to clarify the example again. Yeah. So, so you have two machines, A and B, yes? Mm -hmm. Each of these machines produces some density matrix at all in terms of producing stochastically some pure states, psi, mm. as an output. And let's assume, hope this is uh, okay to assume this, that um, each state is produced. Uh, so you have a random choice of which state is produced, but once this choice is made, it, this state is produced, let's say, a hundred times. Yes, of course you uh. can assume this. So you can say you have product states which with the, uh, um, single state randomly chosen in each shot, this would be the same. Um, now you get a state from machine A, you get a state from machine B. You can approximate the fidelity. And if you choose a larger system, more copies, you can approximate arbitrar arbitrarily well, well experimentally. Now, if you take the average over these fidelities, this is a nonlinear function in the produced pure states from the two machines. Therefore, it will not depend only on the density matrices that are prepared by the two machines. For this, it, it would need to be linear. And therefore, I think this uh, must distinguish between uh, different uh, mm, decompositions of uh, density matrices. So getting closer to understanding the example. Um, so, uh, but I'm not sure that I've quite got it yet. <laughs> we, yeah, but this is maybe but, just to throw the idea in. If uh, you will have any comments on this uh, later these days or something, this would be interesting to know how this relates to to this uh, mm -hmm. ideas of quotienting. And maybe I'm missing something. This also can be. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 yeah. Formulate your example in writing. Yes, yes, I can do this, certainly. Okay, maybe I can add one more question. Uh, and actually, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the notion of generalized contextuality, because I mean, Robert has started already on a, with his question on a rather high level, comparison to Cohen's Becker contextuality. Absolutely sure that not everyone who has uh, followed your talk knows about Cohen's Becker contextuality. <laughs> so, so um, of course, we have seen the formal definition from a quotienting, but maybe you can say a bit more about um, about your favorite definition or notion of it. Uh, favorite notion of contextuality or? Uh, favorite definition of generalized contextuality. You have said that you can motivate this from coming from different sites. So probably you can say a lot about this. Maybe you can mm. motivate it in the prefer your preferred way. 
Right. So how, how familiar is the audience with um, uh, generalized probabilistic theories, GPTs, and the framework of GPTs? I think as familiar as you have introduced them in your talk. <laughs> Most okay, of you. So, so not exceptionally. Um, so that's my favorite uh, motivation. So maybe I'll give it and hopefully it will be clear enough. Um, so if you if you look at, and I'll try to keep this short because I know we're probably cutting into lunch or something over there. Um, so these are <laughs> slides from some other talk I've given, which might be helpful. So you, you can ask the question within the framework of generalized probabilistic theories, which of these theories are classical? So this is kind of what this framework of beyond quantum theories was was you are not sharing for. any slides right now. Oh, just oh no. just to be sure we are not seeing. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting me know. That would have been <laughs> unfortunate. How about now? Yes, now we see. Great. So, so this framework of GPTs was introduced as a kind of landscape of theories, so that we could study which of these theories have which properties. So, a natural thing to ask is sort of which of these theories are classical or classically explainable. And I'll focus on the prepare measure case here, unlike the rest of my talk, which was kind of uh, also for circuits. So traditionally, people think of a GPT as classical if it's what's called a simplicial GPT, which means the state space is a simplex and the effect space is a dual of the simplex. So in three dimensions, a simplex is just this triangle here. In four dimensions, it's a tetrahedron. So it's kind of um, higher dimensional triangles are simplices. And the dual of the simplex is this kind of uh, hypercube um, here in three dimensions. It's just a regular old cube. Um, and the reason that these G are the kinds of GPTs, so, OK, maybe I should slow down a bit. Each point in this triangle is uh, a valid state. And each point in this um, cube is a, a valid effect in the theory. And when you take inner products of the vectors associated to states with the vectors associated to effects, that's how you generate the data in your theory. And so this is kind of just a, a generalization of like, if you think of the block ball and the block ball of effect uh, and the inner product as the trace inner product, um, then you know it's this is kind of a generalization of that to other geometries and different geometries lead to different sets of observable data within the theory. So if you imagine a world where the state space and effect space is given by a simplex and the dual instead of, for example, the quantum state and effect space that we have today. Well, uh, these are what people have considered to be classical theories. And it's kind of clear why. So if I label, if I choose these vertices to be at the points of the unit, the, the three unit vectors, and similarly for these, well, you can see that I'll get valid probabilities when I take all the inner products between states and effects here. Um, and furthermore, you can see that the set of normalized states here, just this triangle, are it's isomorphic to the set of probability distributions over three classical states. So the vertices here can be viewed as classical states. So maybe this is like a, a three-sided dice, if you like. Um, and the set of points in this simplex are just probability distributions over those three. So it, it's a representation of your uncertainty about the classical state. And then measurements are just like uh, ways of learning about these about the true state of the system. So this is how you would represent, as a GPT, a classical statistical theory. It's just uh, isomorphic to the set of probability distributions over a set of classical states. And here is the example of three classical states. But obviously, you can generalize this to higher dimensions. And so this point here would be the, the state of uncertainty, where you're equally likely to know it's one of these two classical states. The state of total uncertainty would be right in the middle, one third, one third, one third, and so on. And the reason people. Uh, kind of more reasons why this is sensibly thought of as a classical theory. Well, every mixed state has a unique decomposition into pure states. So here, this point here is has this unique decomposition, probably one third of each of the pure states, and so on. So you can always imagine that there's a single true state of the system, and any mixed state can be uniquely interpreted as uncertainty about that true state. So this is kind of how we think about classical um, systems and uncertainty about classical systems. Furthermore, all the logically possible measurements are physically possible in this theory, and they're all compatible. So that's maybe not totally obvious from what I've said, but you can prove that 
all measurements can be done in a single super powerful measurement. So you can exactly determine the true state of the system with a single measurement. So pretty much everyone who studies GPTs agrees that this, that uh, simplicial theories are classical. There's, there's no ambiguity about that. And what we realized is that there's a lot, a larger set of GPTs, which you can also think of as classical. In particular, let's think about sub theories of a simplicial theory. So GPTs whose states and effects are a strict subset of those from a simplicial GPT. So if you take your simplicial GPT and you just claim that certain states of knowledge are impossible for some reason, this is kind of like in uh, the Speckens toy theory, there's certain states of knowledge that you just can't ever access. So maybe you can never learn the vertices. You can never learn exactly what the ontic state is for some reason, um, what the classical state is. If you just postulate that, you get a new theory which lives inside the simplicial theory. So it's a, it's a sub theory of a classical theory. So naturally, you would expect these to be classically explainable as well, um, because you can you can always imagine that the vertices are still they're still logically possible. So you can imagine that there is still some true state of the system associated to one of these vertices. But it's just that the the way that you can have knowledge about those true states is restricted in some way. And so the ontology, the sort of the true representation of the properties of a system, doesn't have to change at all if you're just living if all the states and effects in your GPT are living inside the, this simplicial GPT. So, uh, right. So we call these simplex embeddable GPTs. And to make a long story short, we proved that um, the only GPTs which have an ontological model are exactly these GPTs, the ones that kind of fit inside uh, these simplicial GPTs, which everybody agrees are classical, everybody in the framework of everybody who studies these quotiented operational theories. Um, so I really like this. It kind of shows, it, it, even if you'd never heard of generalized non-contextuality, I think a completely natural thing to do would be say, let's look at these, these natural classical statistical theories within the GPT framework. This is what they look like. Anything that fits inside one of those is, is got a natural classical explanation. And that's exactly the same set of GPTs for which you can find an ontological model which is to say it's exactly the set that describes operational theories, which are generalized non-contextual. Um, and it's also kind of nice because it gives you a simple kind of geometric picture instead of kind of looking at one, one way to prove generalized contextuality is to sort of derive inequalities and then test your data on those inequalities and see that they're violated. And that all kind of looks like the way people study Bell scenarios. And it's nice because we can use a lot of the same tools but this new approach is also very nice because you can kind of sidestep all that. You don't need to talk about inequalities. You can just talk about the overall shape of the theory. And just looking at that shape is enough information to tell you whether or not you're admit of a non-contextual representation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question. We're already over time, so I think we should move on and we can save the rest of the questions for tomorrow. Um, so before we move on, though, maybe we can thank the speaker again. Thank you all. See you on Thursday.